Good afternoon. Welcome to the Academic Partnership Webinar, Engineering Your Personal Brand as a Manager, presented by Darren Maynard. My name is Anne Boy, and I'll be facilitating today's webinar. Today's presenter is Dr. Darren Maynard. He presented a webinar last year, and we're happy to welcome him back today. Dr. Maynard is the Training and Operations Manager at Solid Support in Sydney, Australia. He has worked in the digital media, education, construction and energy sectors in Australia and in the Caribbean. He earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Industrial Engineering from the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine, a Master of Science degree in Program and Project Management from the University of Warwick, and the Doctor of Philosophy in Built Environment from the University of Technology, Sydney. Welcome back, Darren. All right, Anna, thank you. I'm just going to share my screen. All right, okay. Excellent, good. Uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Anna, for the introduction. Now, before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the various lands on which we meet virtually. We pay our respects to our, to our respects and thanks to the indigenous elders past, present, and emerging. We welcome any indigenous people who are present this afternoon. I also acknowledge that the land we meet on were never ceded, always was, always will be indigenous lands. All right, I'm Darren Reynard, and my pronouns are he, him. I'm speaking from Morang in Gadigal country. For those of us who don't know, Morang is the Aboriginal name for modern day Sydney. And Gadigal country is the name of the traditional owners of the land where Sydney sits. As always, whenever we do a, press, uh, a webinar or talk, or we give knowledge, we always give out acknowledgement of country if we are not of Aboriginal um, heritage, but if you have Aboriginal heritage, we'll be a welcome to country. All right, good. So as Honor nicely introduced, I am the Training and Operations Manager for Solar Support here in Sydney. It's an Australian consultancy firm. We won't be working across any construction field, but we have also expanded to working with clients and it, uh, well, associated with it, such like lawyers and um, in terms of government agencies. We work across the country, construction planning. We do BIM, CAD, visualization, forensic planning, training, which and project management services, business intelligence, and software. So I'm the practice lead for training and project management office services. So I'm an industrial engineer by training a project manager by specialization and a consultant in practice. Um, concurrently as well, I also am a casual academic in the project management degree program at Curtin University, which is located across in Western Australia, and as well as an adjunct research supervisor on the project management degree at the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine. All right, so First, we're going to be talking about personal branding and on how is that that matters for us as engineers, as bud as um, as bud in engineering professionals, or coming to become about an engineering managers, right? So for consultants like me, the personal branding is not just a preview of the social media influenza, all right? As engineering professionals, our reputation in impacts on how we are perceived in the market and how we get work done and how we get work from our clients. When you become an engineering manager, your personal brand becomes even more important. Your personal branding starts from the first day on the job and influences your teams, your colleagues, and your clients. This webinar focuses on how to engineer your personal brand from the, from the engineering professional to the engineering manager. Right. Now, this topic holds a special spot for me uh, because I cover this during my, my own PhD research. Right. So the aim of my PhD research was to establish empirically how that the, the competitive strategies employed in the business-to-business -business market for engineering consultancy services in New South Wales, all right? 
I found that the consulting engineering companies can apply a value innovation engineering strategy where they operate in micro markets where there are very few competitors. They are reliant on the, on the expertise of their leading consultants. They can charge a premium for their services because of the consultant's knowledge or expertise. Now, alternatively, the engineering consultants may apply a commoditized engineering strategy. The consulting engineering companies are reliant on having a favorable price for their services based on the client's willingness to pay. Now, there are numerous com competitors in the micro markets they operate in. They're considered like every other engineering firm by clients. So in this case here, the value, the value in the innovation engineering strategy is the ideal competitive strategy desired by the engineering company. However, because they, they can be forced into a commoditized engineering strategy by the client or by the presence of too many competitors. So then that's becoming like a re retail engineering. And then there's a hybrid engineering competitive strategy, which is based on operating in different micro markets with different mar market structures. Here, the engineering company adopts its competitive strategy to, to best suit the micro markets. And as you could see, where you have engineering firms and they may have multiple practice, and then there will be different approaches that they will take depending on their micro markets. Similar to what we do as a con construction consultancy firm, where we, in some of our markets, we may feel a bit retail a bit because we have multiple um, competitors there, but in other parts of the market, we, we act as a value innovation because we can charge a higher price because we are the only ones there, or there's very few competitors. So we are, we are adapting our, comp our competitive strategy across different consultancy practice. And, and what comes up a lot for us, it's around our personal brand, all right? And so with your various markets that we wanna look at, the consultants will have to use their professional reputations to get them into the market. And then we gotta be thinking about that because we are all doing a degree we expect it to hopefully get a job. And for us to get a job, it day involves economic markets. You know, is there a, a requirement? Is there a need? Is there a want for the services that we can provide to people? All right. And so as new engineers or new engineering managers, your personal branding follows you as you progress in your career. And I say some of us here might be graduate students, so we're moving our, our, our professional career um, or knowledge base there from undergrad to graduate studies as well. Now, just like you can design a new engineering system, you can design your personal brand as well. You can write your own narrative, all right? The personal brand is a mixture of professional attributes, which I'll talk about, your psych, uh, physical attributes, all right? As well as psychological attributes. Now, for the benefit of the attendees, all right, I will be breaking down the different components of this personal brand. Now, it may sound formulaic, however, in practice, it requires a dynamic flow of these different attributes. It's powered by emotional intelligence, because as you learn how much of the professional, physical, and psychological attributes to contribute into this mix to produce your personal branding. Now, as you move through the professional career as an engineering manager, you will find at times one attribute type may become more important depending on the situation. You will have to also be an active participant in tweaking that mixture to suit the situation. All right. So let's get into this mix. Feels like, as I said, like a little recipe that we are building. So let's start with your professional attribute of your personal brand. Now, as an engineering manager, you will have both those hard and soft skills that are, that are necessary for both engineering and management sides of the role. So, and that's something interesting when we say when we do engineering management, that we see the engineering aspects of, okay, we are doing some technical calculations, we're doing um, specifications, right now, they're like right, doing some sort of design where I'm consulting hard skills. But 
as managers as well, we also have to look at budgets, which could be a tech hard skill of CAIC, but we also having to coach people, mentor them, uh, discipline, promote. Um, so, so because of the management style of things. And so management both has hard and soft skills in management. Engineering may also have hard and soft in terms of maybe having to explain your ideas or pitch your ideas if you're working in an entrepreneurial field. Yeah. So the, your, for your professional attributes of your brand, we are asking here, are you knowledgeable in the field that you're supervising? Because we're engineer managers, right? So when you're supervising engineers, are people going to say, okay, does this supervisor know what you're talking about? Could they, could they give me any instructions or, or right, in this field? Because that's what we are, because we have to understand there is that, that peer-to-peer respect about what you are, what do you know in that field? Uh, to, and, uh, are you capable of supervising me? Right. Uh, then you talk, do you have specific training for the area you're responsible for? So, for example, you know, I would have been in, as a young engineer, I would have had to be a project manager and I had to supervise people, um, at least the area where I have specifically, I was specifically trained in project management. So I was able to handle the project management aspects of it. Uh, but, but there were certain elements that which I wasn't aware of. And I had to learn up a bit so I am comfortable giving instructions. And I've been able to train, say, some of my subcontractors on some of the what needs to be done because, and that allowed me to have that branding there because I got specific training on the area that which we're, we're, we're working on so that therefore I can have given proper instructions to the staff. Now, do you have a body of work? to demonstrate your competence. Again, as engineering managers, eventually people will say, okay, what did you do when you're coming up through the ranks as an engineering professional? Do you have something to say, okay, yes, you are competent in, in this area that which you are given instruction. Again, remember, this is your professional attributes. This contributes to your brand. Are you adding value as an expert? By the time you come as an engineering manager, and the title of being engineering manager is saying, okay, this person is an expert in a certain area and can guide people, right? So it's, it's different when it's different for saying that you are an engineer and there's a technical knowledge here, but as an engineering manager, we're sort of adding additional responsibilities of being a people manager. Are you able to get people to do things? Are you able to mentor? Are you able to coach them there? Right? And as we come back to asking, are you able to keep up with mentoring people? So as engineer managers, are we going to feel comfortable with you being someone's boss? Are you someone's team leader? All right? Are you capable of making people comfortable to approach you? Because engineering is all about sharing knowledge. Right. And so therefore, are people going to feel comfortable approaching you and say, okay, yes, I am going to learn something from this engineering manager. That's adding to that that personal brand. Because I said we have these three different components and you gotta you gotta master them. You need to make sure that you are treating that. Part of your professional attributes as well, it's again getting those degrees, right? So you're gonna get your degree in and you might have an engineering undergrad, but then in your master's, you get a, 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 an affiliated management degree, give you project management, engineering management, systems engineering, or some people do an MBA or a general ma- management uh, degree. So it gets you that professional, okay. And then you sort of top it off with a couple of certificates around, you know, how to be an effective manager, uh, or do we look at technical writing and negotiating skills, emotional intelligence, for the manager. So these professional attributes are, are showed up again and backed up by saying, okay, of our bio degrees and our certificates. All right. And because as the engineering manager, our professional knowledge and skills in the area provide us what we call it intellectual capital. And that's what you're trading on, your intellectual capacity here to be an engineering manager. Now you can have power based on that position of saying yes. You are the engineering manager, but then you get that respect that you can command from your peers that is also tied to how well 
you know that professional field of engineering. Uh, you're a competent engineer, industrial engineer, mechanical, electrical, uh, geotechnical, you know, adding these different fields here. And the confidence that the people have when you're handling a particular problem is based on the perception that you're competent and capable of handling it. Remember, your branding is all about perception as well. So people need to feel confident that if they ask you to handle a particular problem, you're capable of handling it. Right, and and that's something that came up from my from my PhD is in terms of people's professional competence was a major factor of their brand, and that of the ability to command a certain price for their services is because they have that reputation in the industry of being a competent and capable engineer, and sometimes a competent and capable engineering manager. And so that adds that branding that you need to do. And it is very important to, to understand that. Now, the next part we talk about of this personal brand, it's, it's, it's dealing with the physical attributes, right? Now, these physical attributes are related to everything someone sees and hears, all right? Now, now they are often the trickiest attributes of of personal brand, definitely. And this is something that most of us tend to be most familiar with, where we see, when we talk about personal brand, we see a lot of it, something that's that's centered a lot around the physical attributes, uh, especially in the the age of the social media influencer. They're very much all around the physical attributes of how they actually get their branding. And yes, we do have to acknowledge and deal with that. as an engineering manager, because that's what people see, all right? So that's what you use that to tell your story, speak your truth, right? Now, unfortunately, and something that we got to deal with is that even as you're using that to tell your story, speak your truth, it can be misinterpreted for by personal and societal biases, right? Now, these biases are present and continue to impact on our personal branding of any engineering professional manager. All right. So again, I will approach these from in terms of these are biases that we have here, and then how we're going to put counterpositions around it. Because these physical attributes that we have, we're going to have to sometimes depend on them initially in our when we set up in our careers. And these are the first thing someone sees, this is the first thing that someone hears. And for sometimes for some of us, our physical attributes are some things we kind of just turn off, like a suit, you know, like a filter on an Instagram post, all right? So when we talk about physical attributes of our branding, we got to take into consideration that intersectionality of race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, religion, and language fluency, all right? Furthermore, they're also moderated by your socioeconomic status. Now, the physical attributes of your personal brand I'm manifesting how you present yourself, you know, from your clothing choices, your addiction, and your body movements, they're all part of that personal brand. And that's a very effective board of that. And I, I talk a lot about that. I, I would have talked, mentioned that a bit last year when I did my I initially talk about organizational culture. We talked about how we're tapping into your cultural heritage, all right? And for example, and I will, when I talk about some of the case studies that we talk about, how people use your personal brand, right? We we say here, like, do you, your clothing choice, you know, do you wear those subdued or do you wear energetic colors, palettes, or patterns? Uh, you might think, well, really, is that like does it matter? Yes, it does. You know, again, when when you walk into the room, sometimes that's the first thing someone sees. No one's people said, oh, we shouldn't be worrying about what people dress or look like. I'm like, well, unfortunately, no one is going to know that you have an engineering degree. All right, unless you're going to be walking around with a, a, like a big little necklace that says, I am an engineer and I have an engineering degree. All right. So sometimes what you're, what you're wearing is the first thing someone sees and they assesses be, as part of your personal brand before you can demonstrate some of your, your professional attributes of your brand that you are a very competent engineer. All right. Would you wear culturally significant clothing to work? No, I, for example, will wear my tzatziki um, on, on occasion to the office. I mean, I'm luckily of my skin tone can handle very bright colors. So I'm like, yes, I'm going to work with that. Also, I'm from the Caribbean where 
um, the sartorial choices for us, we we can everyone can wear bright colors or interesting energetic palettes, and we do love to wear our reds because it's part of our national flag. So every time our national team is playing something for the World Cup, uh, for football World Cup, you'll call it soccer in the US, go to soccer in Australia as well. You know, everyone dresses up in red, white, and black. You know, as part of the aspects there. Um, when you say culturally significant clothing, does it in terms of are you going to wear something that is from your, your heritage? Do you feel comfortable wearing that if you're in a space that may not necessarily be your own home country or your um, your minority in a, in a in a different cultural group? Now, would you also wear clothes or badges that identify you as a member of a minority group? Now, we generally will have various Pride Months that we celebrate heritages um, of different um, minority groups, would you wear your pins and badges to signify that as well, right? We also have to be thinking about our personal brand. Are we operating a space where we are speaking either your native language or second language? And it, even for me as a native English speaker, I speak also Creole as well. And there'll be times when if I'm operating Trinidad, I can switch to Creole um, because it, it makes good like, for the situation to explain what's happening or to give instructions, speak switching the Creole actually is a much is a better option. All right. Because it's quick, it's easier. Um, but there are times when I have to keep it in my f- formal English language. But then sometimes here in Australia, I have to be like, uh, I got a brain misfire because I can easily something in Creole, but they don't understand what that means. So I have to be like, how do I translate this into Australian English that makes sense for them? at times and and that so therefore they are that personal branding uh coming in and when i'm presenting or introducing myself where i will sometimes adjust the speed that diction of my accent just so you know sometimes people misspeak as a jamaican accent like no it's not jamaican it's trinidadian uh, and then at times i put it on air yeah, my little welsh accent uh slow it down pronounce a particular way uh especially if i'm doing stuff online Again, it's part of the branding because if I spoke in my natural speed at times, like if I'm socializing, they don't want to sound insane. So I make that conscious decision to say, hey, all right, I will adjust my prediction. It's still me, but I'm making that adjustment, being an effective communicator, especially for my, the work that I do. Um, also, I do also acknowledge like my, my company, I work with, we do have a lot of speakers on non-native speakers of English. And so therefore, I make a conscious effort to adjust my speed so that my colleagues can understand what I'm saying because I'm recognizing that this English is not their first language. So therefore, the speed or some of the lingo that I may use may not, may not translate well across. And I do understand that stuff because I, I speak Spanish. My Spanish has gotten a lot progressively weaker over the years because I don't speak as much of it as before. And I did understand the situation at times where I acknowledge that I cannot be an engineering manager in a Spanish speaking country because my professional Spanish is almost virtually non-existent. Socially, I can exist. Professionally, no. So you want to part of your, that's part of the, the branding, right? And then we also talk about movements. We often have this running joke that engineers are going to be like statues, but I think that is more from cultures of people who are not expressive. Some of us are from cultures that where the use of body language is very important as part of the communication style. And so therefore they'd say, okay, how much of that are you going to tap into? I use it a lot because I'm a trainer. I train people, right? So I'm like, well, I'm going to speak with my hands. That's part and parcel of oh I communicate. I'm consciously trying not to move around a lot because I'm being recorded. Um, but if we were on a stage, I would be moving up and down, hands moving everywhere. Uh, and that's all part of the brand, you know, that physical attributes. Because as an engineering manager, you're gonna have to communicate to people. All right. But one of the things I do tell me handle that is actually stand, I'm actually doing a standing desk. So I'm able to present, I'm able to move around and still be able to communicate effectively. Again, and again, that's part of your personal brand. And be thinking of what is your, your, these physical attributes that contribute to your personal brand. Remember this professional, no one's gonna know, like no one doesn't know when I walk into the room that I have a PhD, 
that I have a master's undergrad. I also was, I'm a certified project manager. Um, I have all these years of experience of doing um, in, uh, project management and, and engineering. They don't want to know any of that. They don't want to know I'm an experimental chef either, you know, unless I'm wearing my chef jacket and you know, I create recipes on the go. But what they see is a lot of physical attributes. So there is part of that that I, I think of as part of like, the first thing they see and I'm controlling that narrative. And then I'm like, all right, I know what I'm doing, hon. I know what I can do. And this is how I do my stuff. So again, you've got to be consciously thinking of that. Now, having spoken a bit about uh, physical attributes, we we and also we want to look here now at the psychological aspect of those personal branding because we did professional, we did physical, we got to look at the third part here. And now, so as an engineering manager, you're going to be a team leader and a mentor, right? And you have to also build that brand identity for yourself in terms of, and when you're building that brand identity here, because that's what you have, you're looking at a brand identity, you ought to be involved in a bit of reflection on yourself. Now, and we ask yourself, how do you create a psychological brand, All right? There's a professional, there's a personal, now we have the psychological. So it really comes down to your personality, all right? And how do you respond to external stimuli, all right? Now, your response it usually comes around between having an internal and external focus, all right? Now, people with an internal focus of control see the world as something that reacts to their own personal actions. So therefore, there's a built-in resilience to working in the intense world of engineering. Whereas an external focus of control see the world as controlling their actions and they're reacting to it. So those people have to learn how to become resilient based because they're prone to blaming someone or something for their losses. So you have the internal and those of us is like, okay, the world, mm -mm, I am controlling you. I am dictating what's happening here. You are not the man. I am the master of my actions where the external focus of control is like, they're always on my luck. Something bad is always happening to me. I need, can you give me some luck, please? And so there are always some, uh, the stars, the stars, the astrologies, uh, they're always about people, something externally, it's controlling the actions. And so they have to learn how to build in resilience as well. So, so, to, so again, you have these different focus of control there and in terms of how people react to those to stimulus right so uh, so you you got to build your character that's a continuous journey here and that can that impacts on what we see as your personal brand as engineering manager right are you open to learning new things so in engineering space we're always learning something new as an engineering manager do you do dominate the space or do you give your colleagues space to shine we must learn humility to avoid hubris especially if your lower selves to become too confident, right? So that personal brand of our engineering manager is moderated by the use of emotional intelligence, right? So emotional intelligence is that moderator. It's divided into four parts, right? The first element, we will see the self-awareness. And the engineering pro uh, professional is cognizant and understands their emotions, the self-awareness provides you an avenue to know what your state of mind is, all right? The second element is self-regulation. You can control your emotions and your response to external stimulus, right? So, so this provides a way for you to express yourself. So that's a self-regulation there. The third element is social awareness. You're mindful of how your emotions and actions impact on other people. This act as feedback to your, to your behaviors. The fourth element is social, social influence. This is how you can elicit or change the emotional state of behaviors of your peers. So you often see a lot of social influencers spend a lot of time on that element of emotional intelligence, but sometimes at the expense of social awareness self-awareness or even self-regulation. So they, so people spend, all, that's why they rise in social influence because they are trying to elicit or change the emotional state of behaviors of their peers. But what we're seeing as an engineering manager, you got to, you can't just focus on social influence alone. You got to, you got to have 
that self-awareness to know where your state of mind is at. You got to be able to regulate the way how you ex- respond to external ex- external stimulus. You got to then also aware of how your own actions are being uh, impacting on people, your peers in your social group. Yeah, it could be professional social group as well, right? So as I said, that our personal brand is powered by emotional intelligence here. You know, you have your professional, your physical, um, as well as your psychological attributes, right? And so you, you weave that personal brand into something concrete by using emotional intelligence, you know? Let's understand that in practice, all right? So for example, we were recruiting some cadets for the, com- uh, for the company. So I look after the uh, people and culture function in the company, and we're recruiting some cadets here. And we were looking specifically at students from the universities. Uh, they will have been at, up to, in a, in a, it could either be from engineering, construction, uh, management, project management. They will have at least minimum two years of the degree, and they can apply. Now, we understood that our cadets and these student applicants were not going to have much professional app attributes in their personal brand story, all right? We don't expect them to have a lot of work experience. And even if they had work experience, it probably could be things like working in a, a, a fast food outlet or a retail store or, or doing some sort of volunteer work over time, all right? So what we had to do, we had to recruit for physical and psychological attributes of that personal brand. Remember, three parts of that brand, professional, physical, and psychological. So in that early stages, we are depending on psychological and physical attributes of their personal brand because the professional brand is not going to be, the arts of it is not going to be as strong, right? So one of our recently hired uh, um, candidates at WC together, he was a pretty soft-spoken fellow, but he was dressed really well. You know, he dressed in a jacket, shirt and tie for his interview. And then um, our dress code is smart casual. So him, that sartorial choice was a stood out. It stood out. People recognize that when you walked in, a lot of you know, consultants came and said to me, Darren, who's that guy? Um, you know, I said, he's here for interview. And I was like, oh, yeah. And, you know, are we going to hire him? You know, we ended up did hiring him, you know, and we placed him. Because uh, we had a second, we placed him in, in one of in one of the consulting practice where we uh, with the clients that we engaged with in that particular practice. I mean, like lawyers and commercial professionals. So he's so I guess we see he's comfortable, you know, dressing that but that particular look because our clients also dress in that sort of very formal uh, shirt and tie and jacket sort of. So it's like okay, yes, and because he also had a strong competence in mathematics. That worked very particularly well for that practice because there was a lot, there's a lot of calculations involved in that practice. So yeah, we did tap into so many professional attributes there, but again, we felt that he will work well with the, the line manager for that practice. So often when we even recruit for that role, we would even say, okay, would you fit in culturally into that space, into that um, the clients that we work with? Would you fit in um, as well in the with the line manager. So that's what we call it professional competence. Professional. There's a culture, profession, there's a professional uh, culture in that space there. So we so that branding. So his so he maybe didn't realize it as yet, but he was already trying to build his personal brand. And that allowed us to say, okay, hey, let's put you into a practice that where you can probably you can fit in and have an initial starting point in your career. Because he's a, he's a final year student in his it's in his degree. And it's okay. We want to get you an opportunity to do that. And it's like, okay. And when I spoke about that last day, we talked about how when we're recruiting, we also got to be thinking about the culture of that person and how they're going to fit in. And that was important for us to make sure that when we hire our cadets, that they fit in as well. And again, what, we, what we're what we going off with is their personal branding, all right? We also had a second cadet who we hired. Now, he dressed in smart casual, similar to what we dressed. It's like, all right, yes. But he had a more engaging personality. I don't have to remember being quiet. Um, it's just that he was definitely a talk. I'm like, mm, all right, all right, I like you. Um, and so we, what we did is we put him into, into the other practice that mainly dealt with a lot of our clients on construction site and project offices. And that worked because he's going to go on site, he's going to be talking to our, our site managers, construction managers, or PMs, or project managers, and contract admins. 
All right. And that's okay. Yes. He can, he can, he can engage, he can chat, he can, you know, get answers from people on site. All right. And that's important as well as that practice has very vivacious people in it and they're very chatty. And I thought, okay, yes, as a cadet, he's a chatty person. He's going to fit in nicely with them as well, because we have to be thinking, okay, we want him to get a good experience as well while we're going to associate, we put him in a practice where, okay, the group of people is there who is going to be very conversational and he's conversational and you fit in. All right. And again, his brand, again, I was his brand. I was his psychological profile stood out to us in that interview of him being an engaging personality. I said, okay, let's match that as well. Because when we're hiring, as I said, when we're hiring cadets, when we're hiring someone initially, you know, as we we have to we have to talk about how important the organizational culture is to a new employee's experience in the company. All right. So your personal brand of an engineering professional impacts on that recruitment success. You know, will you get hired into the company based on your personal brand? You know, depending on where you are in your career, it, it you will have to depend on different mixtures. Of your personal brand you know when you're starting on you rely on the psychological and physical attributes just like all my two cadets did right but however as you gain more experience you know you depend more on your professional attributes you're building up that that body of work you know you're building up more experience so, you, so your professional attributes starts to bring up this you have that body of work to say okay yes you have this experience here especially if you're mid-career all right now as you gain more experience, you gain, you depend more on your professional attributes. Right? Now, you've got to still maintain a good physical and psychological attributes as well. You know, you've got to have that reputation as, you know, as you, as, you, as you build it there. But you still have that body of work that shows your professional competence. Now, by the time you get to a senior level, your reputation, like, you know, it precedes you. Like, you will have built up professional attributes so that everyone knows who you are. They know that you are the person for this engineering problem. And you have this, like, this brand already there. You're comfortable with your personal brand. A good example is that if you look at Tim Cook, who is an industrial engineer, all right? You know, Tim Cook has this brand in the industry already. Now, people like always talk about Steve Jobs, you know, his personal brand was like, you know, it's at least physically you'll wear his black turtleneck and his jeans, but his professional attributes, you know, Apple, you know, there's that brand that he could have that, you know, it outsize a bit. And then there's a bit of psychological and um, physical attribute that adds the brand of, 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 of Steve Jobs or even Bill Gates. So again, people like you, when you look at it, you only dissect their branding and, and some of the politicians have a certain style of branding that they do and that and that, and that goes to it barack obama as a president had a certain brand and style coming up as a noticed his style of changes there was a change in style of his personal brand as he moved through eventually you know sort of as you know in Chicago, all the way coming back up, all the way here to being the president. So again, you see the bill. So you can see some of the politicians do have that unself advantage in branding. So it's the same thing for us as engineers. You gotta manage your brand and you gotta be thinking about okay, what am I doing? All right. And so for me, part of my personal branding is always talking about frameworks, right? I love my frameworks. I work in construction, you gotta have a framework, you gotta have a solid foundation. And so when you're building your personal brand, all right, you gotta think of it like a recipe, right? So, and you gotta adjust it for socioeconomic and cultural factors, all right? Some of us can add hot and savory spices, yes? And others, well, I think you just stick to salt and pepper, all right? That's fine, you do you. So whatever your personal brand is, you just gotta work on it. You gotta make sure that. So you, you gotta add a cup of professional competence, you know, pick a professional certification, practice your communication skills and get feedback on your professional work, all right? You add another cup of physical attributes, practice those languages, embrace your cultural heritage, live your fruits in your expressions, all right, you got to pour in another cup or two of psychological factors. Bring that confidence, but temper it with humility. Be full of pride and top it off with respect. 
right? Mixing that brand with self-awareness, self-regulation, social awareness, and social influence, so emotional intelligence elements there. And then you bake that under pressure, you know, with an engineering job, volunteering, family, and uh, social in, uh, social life, right? And then voila, you build a personal brand as an engineering professional, and then soon to be an engineering manager. So there we are. This is how we see, and I'm sort of walking you through how you engineer your personal brand as a manager. And so, yep. So, Ola, over back to you. Uh, just if there are any, so sort of open the floor for any uh, virtual floor for any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Darren, for that presentation. Um, I really liked your description of uh, Brandon as a recipe. So now we'll start the question and answer part of the webinar. Um, as a reminder, you can still submit questions in the chat. I don't see any questions yet, but I do have one for you. So you were talking about um, earlier, you, 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 were, you were talking about self-awareness and how that is kind of essential as you try to build your brand. How important would you say that self-awareness is? I think so successfully building a brand. Well, it did, remember this sort of self-awareness as for you as your brand is remember recognizing your emotional state or recognizing certain behaviors. All right. Sometimes we as engineers might get a bit too cocky. Or, and we don't realize that we're being so cocky that we're not listening to someone. Um, and so you may come across as being, oh, that person is, is, is so cocky um, that they don't listen to me, they don't respect me. And so you've got to make sure that you're able to like dial it back, right? If you're making a decision, you have to make a decision and you're not in a good head space, you got to be self-aware of that, all right? Because you might be making a decision, you're going to hire somebody or you got to discipline someone. And if you are not in a good headspace to do that, you got to be self-aware. Okay, hold up. Today's not a great for me to do that. All right? That's important. Like, that's something that people have to learn how to build to recognize where they are and how they are feeling. All right? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, I do have a question here. Uh, Sammy's question is... Um, I sometimes see some superior having issues with your personal brand. Have you ever encountered that situation in your career? Oh, my God, yes, yes, true, definitely. Oh. <laughs> okay, let's how we answer this. I'm trying to be diplomatic in my response. So, yeah, see, I'm being self-aware, um, just so I don't bring any, like, you know, anger about the situation at times. So, yes. You may have superiors who might have problems with your, your personal brand because sometimes your brand may clash with how they operate. All right. Um, so for example, I remember it was my first job out of yes, my first job out of uni as in as in so I'm a very what you say, um engaging personality when I speak and because I I've been I am an orator, all right. And so if I had to do this presentation that the managing director somehow wanted me to do, I'm like, I do not know how I had never met the MD before. All of a sudden I hear the managing director's personally requested that I do this project for him. And then my supervisor was like, comes up to me and say like, how did this happen? What did you do? And I'm just like, I do not know. I guess my reputation preceded me, all right? So, because here it is, I'm a destiny intern and a directive comes through from the managing director of this big company that Darren is supposed to do this project for him. And I'm like, like, seriously, it, it, caused, a, it caused a flux, you know? I was like, and I was like, I'm like, well, I guess they heard that I'm really good at orating and I had to go and work, do the special project and I did it, all right? So, it, that can happen. You just have to just you just have to be conscious now. And I was I was socially aware, and this is all due to my emotional intelligence, 
I was socially aware that there was a bit of jealousy on my supervisor's part that uh, a lowly intern was specially requested to do this project and not her. And so I had to be conscious in how I presented my brand and, and not be too cocky. I was like, I got a project and I, I kind of like, I was like, oh, I don't know. And I, but I made sure I, 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 I self-regulated my excitement about choosing to do this project. So again, that's what you're seeing here where I, I had a brand, but I was using my emotional intelligence to actually manage this rather awkward situation here um, where my supervisor was passed over for a big project and I was specially requested. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Pat. Uh, he writes, excellent presentation. Would love to know if any particular brand or brand element is best, or is it most important just to have a brand, any brand? Um, the answer to that is you got to have a brand. As a matter of fact, if some, or sometimes you can have an unfortunate accident in your brand. Okay, I can tell you a story for me. All right, same company. Right, so now... I used to wear glasses and my prescription was pretty bad. I'm like giving you the, again, my brand is, I'm a storyteller. So I've got to give you this, this setting. And I was an intern, same company. And I went to get my eyes tested for contacts. All right. <laughs> and I came back to this meeting and my eyes were really tired. Like, like legit, it took them two hours to get his contacts tested. And here I am sitting at a meeting where the financial controller, we call it the plant controller, which is his financial controller, was meeting. And I was so tired, bright sun, I'm under the AC, and I fell asleep in this meeting. Oh, legit, fell asleep. In, like, this is the big man of our department. And I am just like, oh, shit. Apparently, my, my, my manager comes up to me and says, Darren, the plant controller is wondering if something is wrong with you. You fell asleep in this meeting. I was like, I was like, so here my brand got a little, a little shellacking as some sleepy little tired little intern. So I had to like rework my brand. At, and basically, I practically had to do a rehabilitation of it. I was like, Darren is, I had to like pump up. I did a couple of projects. Uh, a couple of databases. I went and hosted the company's carnival show. Like, bam, rehabilitate that brand. And I, so I, I realized then is if you're not actively managing your brand, your, your, your personal brand, people are going to do that branding for you. So you can have any brand, but you gotta, you got to manage it yourself. Like, don't let people do it for you. All right? They, um, so I was like, Get on top of that. Even if you're an intern, you got to start your brand because that brand follows you, you know. Um, and I, I and so manage it from start. So yeah. The next question is from Michelle. Um, I teach project management to undergrads. Is there anything you would change or add to your talk that would speak to them as they prepare for their first job after college? Um, I will still use the same thing. And I, I mean, I did, that's the, my example where I talked about my cadets will apply to your undergrads is the way I talked about you. When you're coming out of uni or getting into your first job, your personal branding really wouldn't fit on your, on your physical and psychological attributes. Because when we recruit, we cannot like know that you do not have personal like professional experience i will tell you and i'm going to tie back to that internship right i got a call from the hr manager and she told me she had called a couple of they were they were given two people or three people for the internships um with who to call and she said i got the offer without even saying it was because of how i answered the phone that psychological attribute she didn't even meet me she just she said based on how you answer the phone we said we were just going to give you the internship. I was like, cool, because as an intern, I would not have had any professional experience. So my branding, even over the phone, how I answer the phone tells a story. So I would say, I will still do the same talk. And I would just say, you got to make sure you put elements to it. You got to know what you're weak at and show up the strong points because that's what you want to work with. Thank you. Uh, Darren, uh, the next question is from Sammy. 
Can a strong personal brand create a professional conflict within an organization? Oh, therefore, definitely, definitely, yeah. You can have conflicts, right? Because, for example, you might have, some people have a brand of that they are, they very they hog the spotlight um, or they, 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 they need to be seen as the best of everything. And so therefore that could cause friction um, in, in, in a space like, okay, no, I'm going to avoid that person because that person is a difficult person to work with, all right? Um, we have, again, I'm thinking about that internet company I was working with. Oh, actually, no, let's... strong in the professional brand like he was this big expert in the industry in this particular in this particular area but he's just sitting in the corner and no one will speak to him we used to call it like it was considered sort of like a like a, a, a box of secrets like no one will speak to him and people just avoided him and when he left and we got someone else the way she ran that department her branding now everyone knows about the, the consultancy practice people talk with her and that, that is true. You can have conflicts. So his professional brand of, of him being so elevated in, in his competence is really good. As a result, came across him from his psychological branding as being arrogant, had people avoiding him. So you got to be matching that. So this remember I said emotional intelligence. He didn't... Have The way how he came across was off-putting to his peers. So you can have a brand, but you got a temporary emotional intelligence. Um, I believe we've covered all the questions uh, that were submitted. In closing, I would like to thank Dr. Maynard for giving this presentation today. Uh, thank you for taking the time to share the knowledge with us about the importance of branding. Dr. Maynard, do you have any closing comments? I would say this. Keep in mind that your brand is something that you always got to build on. So you got to do a conscious effort. All right. It's, you can change your brand. You know, if companies can do it, so can you. All right. So that's my closing for today. All right. Then bye-bye. Thank you all for attending today's webinar. I, I hope you found it interesting. Have a great day.